Good evening. We're going to begin our service with a song. It's entitled, Constantly Abiding. There's peace in my heart that the world never gave, a peace it cannot take away. Let's, uh, let's stand together and uh, think about that text and just let it warm your heart as we sing. together. Let's open in prayer. Father, thank you that you are always faithful to us and that if we will abide in Christ and continue to be faithful in our walk with you, um, just like the vine and the branch, that we know that we'll bear fruit. And uh, Lord, help, help us in, in our consistency in our life that we would continue to walk close by you. This week, as each day comes, uh, Lord, would we uh, take of our spiritual sustenance that we need uh, every day to fight the battles that you would have for us to fight in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. You may be seated and welcome here tonight to our evening service here on the Sunday night service. Thank you for being here in your place. I want to mention a few announcements here this evening. Saturday is our men's prayer breakfast, and so at 8 o'clock. You can sign up if you didn't get to this morning, men and um, boys and teenage uh, men as well. They can come out and, and uh, enjoy fellowship. We'll start, we'll have a devotion time, uh, eat first, and then have the devotion time break up for prayer. And then afterwards, we'll have a list of some things uh, to do uh, outside, uh, sprucing some things up, uh, some leaves that need to be 
uh, cleaned up and some uh, ditch to, to uh, clear up and some grass cutting uh, as we have and um, maybe even pulling some, some bushes and some things that we need to spruce up for the springtime and then some jobs on the inside, uh, some things that we need to uh, get fresh and uh, wipe, wipe down and uh, be a help. And so if you can come on Saturday morning for a couple hours, I know it'll be a, a blessing uh, this Saturday. And then also want to mention there's a couple sign-up sheets on the bulletin board for in the month of April. We have a ladies' fellowship painting class, uh, 9 to noon on April 6th. And so there is a cost for that as well as a sign-up. And then on the April the 12th, uh, there is a game night on the bulletin board. There's a sign-up for that from 7 to 9 p.m., a couple hours there. That uh, it would be an, an, uh, um, a good time if those of you that like to play game. We had this last year and had a good attendance and a good time. Next Sunday evening, uh, we'll have communion uh, service uh, on Easter evening. And then this coming Sunday, there is no Sunday school in the morning service with Easter. We'll be preparing uh, for the morning service and then um, come at, at 1030. Be faithful in your place. Invite someone. We have some of these flyers that you can uh, hand out. We handed out all our door hangers in uh, the neighborhoods that we've had. We passed out a couple hundred uh, yesterday morning. Uh, and um, But we also, in the library, there's a table just on the inside of the library to the left. There are some neighborhood bags. Within the bag, it's got two uh, bottles of water. It's got some uh, crackers and just some, some snacks and things. Uh, and then a card in there that says, Welcome to the Neighborhood. And that's designed for some of the homes across the street here in Indian Creek uh, in the Ashton Springs, some of those new homes that are uh, being built. And uh, some, some of those have already moved in on one of those roads and then a couple others just kind of off to the side. There's addresses on those bags. And uh, some of those, I delivered some of those this last week and uh, others that you may want to grab a one or two and have an opportunity this week to go by. And uh, you can knock on the door for anybody's home and just introduce yourself, say welcome to the neighborhood. This is a gift from the church across the street. If you don't have a church, uh, we'd love for you to, to come to our church and uh, be a part. And then uh, within, uh, if they're not home, you can leave it at the, at the door there. I understand that. But if you can grab one of those or a few of those, you'd be willing to be a help. Uh, the addresses are on uh, the bag, and you can use that. So grab uh, some of those, I believe. Uh, that, for the most part, is our announcement. There's a missions committee meeting after the service this evening, and so if you'd like to take part in that. We do have uh, two items of business this evening. We'll go ahead and do that at this moment. Uh, we have two biz uh, business items. Um, the first one is um, some mission project fund money, $350. That would go to Nikayla.
attention to our missionary spotlight, and uh, David's going to come introduce our missionary tonight, just give an opportunity and address a couple things, and then say a prayer. All right, thank you. Yes, as Pastor mentioned, we do have a mission committee meeting after the service, so if you're on the mission committee, make sure you head to rooms B and C following the service. Um, also, on Sunday, April 7th, we will have the Bruners with us, and we will have a combined split Sunday school. So the ladies will be together, and the men will be together, but that'll be from the teenagers up through the adults. So we'll have a great time of fellowship with both Kevin and Mary, and then they'll be with us in the evening service on the 7th, so make plans to be here. Um, and tonight, we have the privilege of having Mike and Tammy Ring with us. Uh, they were with us last summer. Uh, for a visit and gave us an update, but since he's here, we would love to have him give us a little bit more of an update while he's present. That's just always helpful and good. Um, they are traveling in for the memorial service, and they'll be headed back out on Wednesday, so we'll be praying for them for travel, but it's always good to see you and hear from you, and also hear what all your kids are up to. So you come on up, Mike, and give us a quick update, and let us know how things are going. Well, good evening. It's been a privilege for Tammy and I to be here. I want to express our appreciation to the church family for the way that you have embraced and taken care of the Crowders, not just during this time, but uh, since they've been here. They're a part of our heart and our ministry there in Brazil, and uh, everyone there sent their love and care for uh, the Crowders. But uh, we certainly wanted to thank you and express our appreciation to the Martins for taking us in and to the church for allowing us to stay here the next few days. As we are working in the mission field, one of the things we're always on the lookout for are Timothys. We're looking for that person to whom we can pass on what God has taught us, a faithful man who will be able to teach others also. And, uh, you know, over the course of my 40-plus years in the ministry, I've never had a situation like we have now. My Timothy is older than I am. I have a Timothy who's in his 70s. As a matter of fact, he's taking care of the services, the same man we mentioned when we were in before, Gilberto. Uh, things have stepped up a notch because he's come to me and said, uh, do you believe that at this stage of my life, uh, perhaps God would be wanting me to pastor or preach? Uh, do I need to be ordained? And so I'd ask you to pray with us about that. Uh, that is a new wrinkle. Uh, we have been looking for the man God would have for the ministry in Villanova at the Bible Truth Baptist Church. And so if this is the man, uh, there will be some stages and steps that we'll need to take. We appreciate your prayers for him recently in uh, a Bible study, one of the ladies, we've probably worked with this lady for five or six years, and she would always come up to a point, and then with some barrier, could not understand about salvation. And finally, Maria Elena uh, said in her own words, I am trusting fully, completely, totally in the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. What a joy and thrill it is, because we use uh, John, 8, 20, or John 8, 31, 32, especially verse 32, you should know the truth. And the truth shall set you free. So we're thankful that she has come to this saving knowledge of Christ. I'm having the privilege of discipling a young soldier. Uh, we're going through the chronological Bible study. And last Friday, David G. said when he came in, uh, Pastor, that's what they call us there, Pastor, Pastor, uh, I need to be baptized. I said, oh, really? Why? Well, it says in the Bible that once you're saved, you're supposed to follow the Lord and believers' baptism. And I'm saved, so I need to be baptized. I said, well, that's a good answer. That's exactly the kind of answer we're looking for. So David G. will be being baptized soon. Brother Dave mentioned our family, you know, the, the uh, Perkins. And uh, I was out in your lobby back when we were in the visit here last summer. My phone rang. Josh said, uh, Dad, I want you to pray about bringing a Brazilian with you to Papua New Guinea, someone that would be an influencer, someone that could come to New Guinea and either be called back or he could go back to Brazil and be influential in sending people to work on as missionaries here in New Guinea. And so, uh, as the Lord would have it, uh, May 6th, I'll be flying out with Luis from Sao Paulo. He's a 27-year-old civil engineer that uh, also teaches at Bible Institute of about 30 or 40 students. And so he does have influence over a lot of young people. And we don't know whether God will call Luis or not, but I appreciate your prayers. We have 49 hours of travel from Brazil, Paris, France, Singapore, Fort Moresby, Goroka, and who knows how we're going to get out to where Josh and Natalie are because the mudslides have shut down their airfield. Could be by the bumpy Toyota Land Rover, I don't know. But we appreciate your prayers. Tammy and I will be going back on uh, Wednesday, and we have a very busy, as you can imagine, weekend with the 
uh, Pasqua, as we call it, uh, the Easter services. Always a time when many visitors will come to our services, sometimes the only time of the year. So would you pray with us that God will use us so we continue to share the gospel and try to plant the Bible Truth Baptist Church in the neighborhood of Villanova in Porto Alegre, Brazil. Thank you for your prayers. All right, let's pray tonight. Dear Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we have to meet here in your house tonight. We thank you for your word. And Lord, we look forward to hearing it tonight. Lord, we thank you for the rings and the ministry that you've given to them in Brazil. Lord, we ask that you would just protect them as they travel this week, provide for their needs, and give them uh, energy as they return home to uh, look at the next weekend. Lord, there's many opportunities um, with Easter and special services. Lord, we think of not just them, but many of our missionaries across the world who will have similar opportunities, Lord. And even here in our own church, we ask for you to open eyes and hearts to the gospel. Lord, make the sacrifice of Christ plain for those that hear it. Lord, we ask that you would, we would see souls saved and you glorified in these services. Lord, we think of uh, the, the trip that Mike has coming up with Louise, that you would give them uh, safety and just make this a wonderful time of ministry as they travel. Uh, again, give them safety and give them health as they uh, travel for so long. Lord, we thank you for their family, and we thank you for the different ministries that you have allowed many of their children to be involved in. Uh, we think about Nikayla and the trip she'll have this summer, and that you just uh, give her a great opportunity of ministry and service uh, with them in Scotland, and just be with uh, this young man he mentioned that uh, needs to be baptized. We thank you for a clear teaching of the scripture, Lord, and we ask that you would give us a good night of fellowship and time in your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we do, let's sing a couple of uh, very familiar songs that I think we can sing and uh, truth resonate in our hearts. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of the glory divine. Would you stand together and sing?
happened there, I just had a Brubaker moment. Uh, <laughs> you remember Brother Comfort and uh, the song leader that he would bring. He'd always wind up out here whenever he wanted to do something fancy. And uh, I'm not like that, but I just had to do that. All right. Let's finish up with uh, Faith is the Victory. Faith is the Victory. We'll just sing two verses. All right. So we can Before you singing, you may be seated. Before the message, uh, John and Anne are going to come and uh, present the selection that they presented at competition this year. I can rely when I 
Over the next uh, Sunday nights, in the next couple months, uh, we're going to share the load on Sunday evenings, walking through the life of Abraham in the book of Genesis. So uh, some of the staff is going to help out uh, the men on uh, taking a chapter, and, uh, and some other men that may be able to be a help and encouragement sharing the load on Sunday nights. And so um, Dr. Mack is going to come this evening. He's going to take Genesis chapter 15 and walk through the passage for us and, and uh, preach a message. So it's uh, honored to be able to have him to speak. And so you take your Bibles. Well, it is an honor to be able to speak tonight. I never take for granted the opportunity to share the Word of God. Genesis 15 is, can be broken down into three paragraphs and would be here till midnight if I took it all. So I'm just going to take the first seven verses. It says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, for I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? Steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, forth abroad, which is the word outside, by the way, and said, look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. And he, that's Abraham, believed in the Lord, and he, that's God, counted it to him for righteousness. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the word of God. We're so thankful for the life of Abraham. Father, a great man of faith. Uh, yet, here in chapter 15, he's wavering a bit. God, And so, Lord, we pray tonight that we too would be like Abraham and come into a stronger relationship with you believing completely in the promises of God. Amen. You know, <clears throat> I often thought, out of all the men uh, of, of the Bible, Abraham would be uh, a person that you'd want to uh, get to know, walk around, be friends with. He was a great man of faith. But he did react, like all of us react, to situations. Times of spiritual reaction are not uncommon amongst the people of God. You go through the Bible and you see these reactions to situations. Remember Elijah, on top of uh, Mount Carmel in 1 Kings 18? What a great victory. And yet he comes off the mountain and he runs away from Jezebel. You think of Joshua going around the wall, going around Jericho, and uh, <clears throat> seeing the walls come down. Great victory. And he reacted in a not so good way, because when they went up to Ai, they didn't take everybody like God had wanted them to, and they lost the battle. And so it is with us. Sometimes we get on the mountaintop and, boy, we're feeling good. And then all of a sudden, we're taken down into the deep valley. And so it was with Abraham. The new, remarkable, and in some respects, exciting events connected with the rescue of Lot, the victory over the five kings, meeting with Melchizedek, 
And the king of Sodom showed us what a man of character Abram was. He was on top of things. But Abram wasn't immune to feeling insecure. And the pendulum, as we can see in chapter 15, at least for a while, was swinging the other direction. There's a definite connect with the preceding chapter because the first three words of chapter 15, after these things. And preacher scared me to death last week when he started going into chapter 15. I'm glad he hesitated and didn't go any further. <clears throat> Let's notice some things tonight. First of all, I want you to see three things. First, there's a divine revelation. After these things... Let's stop there and ask the question, after what things? After the battle with the five kings, the rescuing of Lot and all the belongings of his people, after meeting with Melchizedek, <clears throat> the king of Salem, who is a type of Christ, after refusing to be rewarded by the king of Sodom, after these things. But now the king of Sodom has gone back to Sodom, taking all those things he took in the spoils with him. Melchizedek has gone away after spending some wonderful fellowship with Abraham. Even the two men that went with Abraham to f fight in the battle, they were gone. Lot and his family with his ten children, they were, they were, uh, they had gone back to Sodom, a foolish decision, but they went back to Sodom and and Abraham finds himself alone. And we'll see in a little bit that that loneliness caused him to start to waver. Being alone has a tendency of our emotions shifting from being on top of the mountain and going into the valley. And with that descent, we turn our eyes off of what God has done, and we turn our eyes on potential problems. And the emotional slide usually ends up in doubt and fear, both emotions of insecurity. Now, I don't know what you're going through in your life, but I do know that all of us face fear. All of us sometimes go through doubts. We actually have to preach to ourselves that that's not the way to do it. That's not the attitude to have. After these things, so Abraham's alone, and in a vision, God speaks to his need. And God reassures Abraham's faith with these words. Fear not. What does that tell you? God knows everything, so Abraham must have been fearing something. It's been ten years since God promised him a son, and yet he doesn't have a son. Maybe he was wondering if God was really going to come through. You ever wondered if God was going to come through on a promise? I've talked to people even this week about the second coming of Christ. And the question that goes through our minds, is he really coming? What in the world is he waiting on? And the answer to that is the long-suffering of God. I don't know about you, but sometimes we wonder. Someone was saying yesterday at the, at the uh, memorial service about their mother, who's close to 100, maybe a little over. She says, I want to get out of here. Has God forgotten about me? Sometimes we doubt God and his plan. 
So God looks at Abraham and he says, Abraham, fear not. By the way, this is the first mention of those two words in the Bible. It's followed by 364 other fear nots, one for each day. And this is often the message that God gives to the children of God. You know, when you go to the book of Malachi and you finish Malachi, there's 400 years after Malachi and Matthew. And God doesn't say anything. But you get into Matthew and the first thing you read that God says through the angels is fear not. For I bring you good tidings of great joy. So this matter of fear is one of the things that we fight. Why shouldn't Abraham fear? He'd made enemies. He was all alone. And God answers that. God says, I am thy shield and exceeding great reward. How appropriate to the need of the moment was this twofold revelation of God and his servants. And by the way, when you go through the valley, that's where God is going to speak to your heart. Let him speak to your heart. Get to know God in a greater way. God is a shield for us. He's a covering. When I was three or four years old, I was scared to death of the dark. I mean, I was petrified of the dark. I would many times take a flashlight to bed so I could have some light. My dad caught me one night because I would always take that flashlight and shine it around the room to see if there was anything out there to get me. And Dad said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. He says, you're four, but when you turn five, I'm turning the hall light off. I never was so fearful of a fifth birthday in my life. And the hall turned it off. Because I would wake up in the morning and it was always off. So obviously, mom or dad were turning the lights off before they went to bed. But I was petrified. My fifth birthday was coming. Mom knew about it. And so she gave me a blanket. It had some cartoon character on it. And she said, here, wrap yourself up in this. It'll protect you. I looked at that blanket and I said, you got to be kidding me. Dad knew the light was going to be shut off. And he went out and he bought me my first stuffed animal. And it was a lion and it was as big as I was. I called the lion Leo and I tucked that lion into bed every night. I finally gave the lion up when I turned 15. <laughs> it had both eyes out of it. Its nose was gone. Its tail was removed. But I remember I carried that blanket everywhere with me. God is a shield. He is a blanket of protection for us. I want to read some verses that have that word shield in it. Psalm 3, verse 3, But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and a lifter of my head. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler, same Hebrew word as shield, and the horn of my salvation and high tower, Psalm 18, 2. 
Psalm 1830, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. Psalm 84, 9, behold, our God is our shield. And look upon the face of thine anointed. He shall cover thee with thy feathers, Psalm 91. And under his wings thou shalt trust. His truth shall be the shield and buckler. One more verse. Psalm 119, 114. Thou art my hiding place, my shield. I hope in thy word. And you see where the shield, the buckler, is tied into the word of God. And what I'm saying, folks, is when you fear, when you have difficulties, wrap yourself up in the blanket of the word of God. Let it be your comfort let it be your shield. Let it be your, your, your hiding place. God is a shield to all of those that have enemies. And then God is an exceeding great reward. After Abraham turned down the king of uh, uh, Sodom's uh, offer to give him the spoils of the battle, which were rightfully Abraham's, but Abraham refused them, lest the king of Sodom would be, could claim that he made Abraham rich. The king of Sodom goes back to Sodom with the stuff Abraham refused, and Abraham returns to his tent alone. But God wouldn't allow Abraham to be a loser in all of this. He knows what he sacrificed. And God says to Abraham, Abraham, you don't have the things of Sodom, but you've got me. I am your reward, not just a reward, but a great reward. Not just a great reward, but an exceedingly great reward. You can't get any better than that. Now, would you rather have the stuff from Sodom, or would you rather have me? I will protect you. I'm your shield. I am with you. I am your reward. You're not alone. And so when we face fear in our life, remember you're never alone. You may sense loneliness, but you're not alone. Some nights when I go hunting, I go up to my cabin out in the woods, it's dark. I mean, it's dark. And I lock both doors. There's really nothing to do after the sun goes down because you can't see anything. So you go to bed early because you've got to get up early. You lay there and you start hearing things creeping outside. Scratching on the door. I thought it was Ken and Jackie at one time. And I had to remember you're not alone. God's with you, God will protect you. And if you've never been out in the woods alone, where there's not supposed to be anybody but you're hearing things, fear will come upon you. That Wonder. And then you hear something scratching at the door. So you take your rifle and you're ready for something to come in. Rifle in one hand, pistol in the other hand. And the thought that God's with you. If God's with you, nothing can harm you unless he wants it to. So you put your rifle down, you put your pistol down, you lay back down, you fall fast asleep. God says, I'm going to protect you. I'm with you. I'm your reward. And he's a sure reward because God doesn't die. 
He's an eternal reward because God is eternal. He's a satisfying reward because God knows exactly what we need to satisfy us. He's an infinite reward because God can't run out. You realize some people think the crowns that we would win are our reward in heaven. I don't think so. We're going to take those and we're going to give them to Jesus. Some believe heaven is our reward. No, I don't think that's right either. Listen to the word of God. I am your exceeding reward. That's a relationship with Almighty God. So don't allow yourself to live in a state of fear. It's a divine revelation. Secondly, there's a despondent response. And I want you to see this because because in verse 2 and 3, Abraham goes, goes back to a promise that God had given him. Abraham said, the Lord, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? Hey, God, remember? You promised me a child, and all I have is this Eliezer guy. And he's from Damascus. He's not my child. And Abraham, lonely, perhaps wondering about all that's transpired, gets this pledge from God and the assurance, even though he's lonely, he's not alone. And Abram said to the Lord, well, see what you're going to give me. The steward of my house is this Eliezer from Damascus. And Abram said, behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is my heir. So Abram speaks to God about two things. First, he recognizes a problem. I go childless. You can almost hear his loneliness. And then he mentions Eliezer. Eliezer was going to, if Abraham died before God came through, he would get everything Abraham had. He was the oldest servant of Abraham's camp. So he recognizes a problem. And again, I say, when we're alone and we're fearful, we start focusing on the problems. And then he remembers a promise in Genesis 13, 16, where God promised Abraham, I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall he also uh, know the number of your seed. And Abram reminds God that God has not given seed to Abraham, and because of it, he was childless. What was Abram doing? What do you do when you find yourself alone and in the need of something for your future. He was casting all his care upon the Lord, for he was just told that God cared for him. I'll protect you, I'm your reward. God was the answer to his loneliness. God was the answer to his fear. God was the answer to his future. What is your response? When the way gets lonely or fearful, or you question your future. Is it doubt? Or do you reach down in the depths of your soul and let your faith take a deeper root and believe God? The divine revelation, fear not. Then he tells Abraham why he shouldn't fear. The despondent response Cast your care before God. Thirdly, the divine reassurance, verse 4. And behold, the word of the Lord came into him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, and he shall not come forth. He that shall come forth out of thy own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven. Now get, get the picture. He's telling Abraham, Count the stars. So it was nighttime. So he's feeling alone, he's feeling fear, and it's the middle of the night. 
And God takes him outside. The word abroad is the word outside. And he says, count the stars. I don't know, in town you can't see the stars like you can if you're outside the city limits and out in the middle of nowhere. I remember when I went hunting out in Wyoming, we were 12 miles back in the mountains, and uh, there we, we were sitting under the stars, and there were so many stars it looked like there was a cloud above us. I took the binoculars and I looked up, and they were stars. They were everywhere. I'm reminded of Psalm, what is it, 147, where God says that he can number the stars and he knows each of them by name. What a God we have. And this is the God that says, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to give what you need for against all your foes. So fear not. Four things, very quickly. His faithlessness was corrected. God simply says, is not going to be your heir. What's the principle? God always comes through on his promise. Always. Or he wouldn't be God. If God gives us a promise and it doesn't come through, then God's lied to us, which means God's not God. Here's the first promise. The Lord appeared to Abraham, Genesis 12. Unto thy seed I will give thee the land. And Abram built an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Here's the second promise. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth. So that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. So his faith is corrected. And then his faith was instructed. But he that comes forth, verse 5, out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And here, here's, the Lord gives the details of Abram and his future heir. Abram at this time was somewhere between 90 and 100 years old. That meant God was going to have to do something supernatural. Because 90 to 100 year old men are way past childbearing. Producing a child. Sarah was 90. So God was going to do something supernatural to bring about and to honor his promise. This just gave Abraham a new ground of trust. A measure to expand his faith. And the Lord is always trying to expand our faith. To grow our faith. That's why we have so many problems. So he can come through for us and we can know God did this. His faith then was encouraged, verse 5, and he brought him outside, showed him the stars. And God encourages Abraham's faith with three metaphors, the dust of the earth, chapter 13, verse 16, the stars of heaven, chapter 15, verse 5, and if you move forward to chapter 22, verse 17, the sand of the seashore. How can our faith be strengthened? How can our faith be reassured? How can it be encouraged to expand, rehearse the promises of God? Read through the Word of God and get a hold of the promises that God gives us and let them go over and over and over in your heart and mind. And then as faith is expressed, Verse number six, and he believed the Lord, and he, that's God, counted it to him for righteousness. 
this verse shows the change that was taking place in Abram. He had faith before, but now it's more prominent. Now it's clearer. Now it's stronger. Now it's a fuller trust in God. And every time we go through something that is unpleasant, and we see God work, and we see God come through for us, we trust him a little deeper, a little more. Do you know what the original Hebrew word is for he believed? It's the word amen. Now, we don't hear many amens in the church. I heard one this morning. It's a blessing to my heart. How many of you used to be over at the Meta Hills Church where Homer was there? How many of you? Huh? Some of you remember that? Homer was a, li- was a short little guy who was in his 70s, but he had a mind of a five-year-old. His father had thrown him against a wall, and it caused brain damage. But Homer would say, amen, that's the truth. And I was preaching over there one time, and I was preaching and really cranking it out. And I said something like, God is all wisdom. I'm not very smart. And Homer chimes in, amen, that's the truth. (laughs) Homer's in heaven. You know, faith is the only adequate response to God's revelation. Faith. Where do we find God's revelation? It's in the Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Wrap yourself up in the protection of the Word of God. That's what Jesus did. Three times he was tempted, three times he's quoting Scripture. Faith takes God at his word. Can you believe it? Do you believe it? Well, Abraham did, and as a result, God counted Abraham's faith as a channel for the reception of the gift of righteousness. The spiritual result is described in one significant word, righteous, the condition of being spiritually right with God. God himself is the object of our faith. The word of God is the ground of faith. The spirit of God is a channel of faith, and the righteousness of God is a result of faith. So let me close with four statements. There's always this side of heaven, the possibility of spiritual despondency. It happens to believers. Let me restate that. It happens to every believer. Sometime in your life, probably many times in our lives. It happens to churches. Churches, sometimes it happens church-wide. And it's usually brought on by three things. Physical weariness. Emotional drainage. sometimes spiritual carelessness. But understand there's always this side of heaven, the possibility of spiritual despondency. Are you despondent tonight? Does God mean more to you now than he used to? Or does he mean less? Does the word of God thrill your soul like it used to? Or is it less? Secondly, there's a peril of spiritual disheartenment. Satan can get us to follow the pathway where we are just ready to give up on God. Now, he can't take our soul to hell, but he can make us worthless, useless. 
the long wait for God to act sometimes triggers something in us that becomes disheartened toward God and his work and his word. A fear that God won't come through. And then there's the third statement, protection against spiritual discouragement. What is it? Saturate yourself with the promises of God. Get yourself into God's progressive revelation and learn that he is our shield. He is our blanket of protection. He is really our exceeding great reward. Not facts about God, but God himself. And fourthly, there is a preciousness of spiritual discipline Remember, God's delay to Abraham weren't, wasn't his denial. And sometimes we think God's denying us something we need, but he's just delayed. It was to bring Abraham into a closer relationship with God, and that's what God's trying to do with us. Get us closer and closer to him, because he loves us. It was to stretch his faith by getting him to depend more upon the Lord. God wanted Abraham to grasp that statement. Fear not. Literally stop allowing yourself to fear. For I am your shield. And I am your exceeding great reward. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the principles you've given to us through this message. And I pray that your spirit would take it, penetrate our hearts. Father, I pray you'd encourage that one who's despondent. I pray for perhaps those watching on live stream, work in their heart. Help them to take time to wrap themselves up in the word of God, trust your word to protect them. Father, help us not doubt you. Help us to understand you have a perfect plan for our life. Help us understand that the delay of Almighty God coming through for us is not necessarily a denial. Expand our faith. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I wonder tonight, the Lord has spoken to your heart. Say, preacher, this message was for me. And I'd like you to pray for me because there's issues in my life. Would you slip your hand up right now? Let me pray for you. Every head's bowed, every eye's closed. Yes, I see it here and here and here and here and back here and over here. God bless you. Are there are others. Pray for me. Oh, wrap yourself up in the blanket of the Word of God. and sense the comfort of God. Father, we thank you for these who have lifted their hands. Ask God that you would bless them, help them, strengthen them. May they not doubt God. 
May they get a hold of the promises of God and be strengthened as you expand their faith to come into a closer relationship with you. Thank you again for the word. We pray, Lord, that you would give us a good week, strengthen us, help us to serve thee. Lift up that one who's discouraged. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Mack, for a message. I pray it was a blessing, encouragement to you this week. Go forth in the Lord, knowing that we are conquerors in Jesus Christ. God bless you. You are dismissed this evening.